to Calvary Chapel Hilo. Tonight, let's, uh, you can open your Bibles if you have them to Isaiah chapter 7, but let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word, uh, for the privilege of studying it, Lord, and uh, just for being able to know you, God, and communion with you this way and relate to you in this way. Um, just ask that you would open our hearts now to what you have for us tonight, that you would speak to us through your word, by the power of your Holy Spirit, and that you would write your word on our hearts. Just prepare us now for the the things that you want to pick out and that you want us to hear, Lord, uh, that you want to stay with us, that you want to use in our lives. And we just ask, Lord, that you'd be glorified by it, by this time together. And we just love you, we praise you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so getting back into our study of Isaiah chapter 7 tonight. Um, Last, or I guess it's three weeks ago now, we went through Isaiah 6, where we saw Isaiah uh, see the Lord. We saw him kind of see the reality of who he was and see himself in light of the Lord. And then we saw him respond to the Lord's calling. And so we saw like the redemption, the deliverance, and then the call to ministry for Isaiah. And here in Isaiah 7, we kind of see the opposite of that when it comes to King Ahaz, the kind of lead figure in much of this this chapter where the Lord wants to show him, the Lord wants him to see, but he refuses. I was, uh, I came across a, a story from 2020, uh, earlier today, about a 20-year-old woman with cerebral palsy who was pronounced dead by paramedics. They'd responded to a call, and she was pronounced dead, placed in a body bag, and then was found alive three hours later. And it turns out that after checking the woman and declaring her dead, the, the woman's godmother, who was a nurse, told the paramedics that she thought she detected a faint pulse, that she thought there were signs of life when she checked. But the paramedics stuck to their declaration that the woman was dead. And it was when the body bag was opened up as they were preparing to embalm the body, they thought, uh, that it was discovered beyond any shadow of a doubt that she was, in fact, still alive. Eyes open, breathing, all of that stuff. In the end, the, the fire chief who was in charge of these, these paramedics who responded, as well as the paramedics themselves, they expressed just disbelief, I read, at, at how this could have happened and an extreme disappointment for having missed the signs of life. If only they had seen the signs The whole thing would have been avoided and the woman would have gotten the care she needed from the start. Now, the worst part about this is that the the, the godmother was there pointing to one of the signs that was missed. She was pointing to the signs of life, the, the, the pulse. And it wasn't that they went and investigated what she had brought to their attention and then just couldn't see the signs or didn't find the pulse after that, it was that they dismissed the signs in favor of what they had already decided. They had claimed, no, it's just an involuntary like muzzle, muscle spasm, essentially. And they dismissed it. And that's what we see with King Ahaz as we look at our text this evening. We see a king who had a choice to either follow God and lead the nation in the direction that the Lord wanted them to go, or he could reject the Lord and go his own way, even as the Lord was trying to give him a sign that would reassure him in making the decision to follow God. And this this, this, this decision by Ahaz set Judah on the track that led to the Lord's judgment and their captivity in Babylon, and ultimately, you could say, to the complete disillusion of the nation. That's not the whole story, though, as we will see. For the Lord, in his great faithfulness, would give a sign to the nation, 
even as the king rejected the sign that he was offered. And I'm speaking of the sign of Emmanuel, God with us, born of a virgin, our Lord Jesus Christ. And what we are going to see is that though we aren't to be seeking after signs and wonders in order to believe, that's not the point that that we have here, but willfully choosing to ignore and refuse the signs that have been given is a path that leads to destruction and judgment. And so with that, we're going to start in the first couple verses here of Isaiah chapter 7, where we read, Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying, The Arameans have camped in Ephraim, His heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. So again, remember that Isaiah is writing during the time of the divided kingdom. The nation of Israel was split into two nations, Judah in the south and Israel, also known as Ephraim or or the ten tribes in the north. And, And during this time, there were three main superpowers in the region. The greatest of these was uh, Assyria at this point. Um, the Assyrians dominated the Middle East, and, and Egypt was kind of the has-been, and then Babylon was the, the rising superpower that was you know, waiting for their moment to take over the, the, the region, to take over for Assyria as the great superpower in the region. And the kingdoms of Israel were right in the middle of these three. So in a time where they needed to be united and trusting in God, they were divided and playing power politics, trying to ensure their futures on their own. And when the northern kingdom of Israel joined with Syria to to come against the southern kingdom of Judah, rather than joining or, or, or surrendering to them, Ahaz decided to go to the king of Assyria, for help. And and I'm going to mention this later, but you can find this, all all of this in 2 Kings chapter 16, what what all goes on with Ahaz and and Assyria and all of that. But what we see here is that, and I'll talk more about it in in a little bit, but Ahaz and the people of Judah were afraid. Israel and Syria are, are ganging up on them. They want to put someone in place on the throne of Jerusalem who will join with them and and go fight against the the Assyrians. But Ahaz should have trusted in, in the Lord. The people should have trusted in the Lord. And this is a great example for us. Sometimes, you know, there comes a point where the people of God have to, they have to make a stand for God. They have to make a stand in the Lord. There comes a point sometimes where we need to make a stand for other people, but most often we want to make our stand for ourselves. If we're going to be putting ourselves out there, we want it to be for ourselves. You know, we worry about our own rights, our own desires, our own opinions, sometimes much more than we worry about what the Lord wants or or what the Lord has, has said or what's best for just the people, other people. And this is where Ahaz is at. He can either trust the Lord or he can take matters into his own hands to make sure that he stays on the throne, to make sure that he doesn't lose his rights as king of Judah, to make sure that his kingdom stays intact. He can make his stand for himself and play the political power games, or he can seek the Lord and trust him. And ultimately, as we're about to see, he takes matters into his own hands hands. And it just leads him farther down the path of rebellion against God. Something else we'll see is that the Lord wasn't asking Ahaz to take one of these, like an awesome leap of of blind faith. As, As I mentioned, the Lord comes to him wanting to bring him a sign, which is often where we, we find ourselves. He's trying to prove to Ahaz that he is worthy of his trust. And 
we're, we're like, Lord, give me a sign if this is what you want me to do or how you want me to live. But what we'll see is that Ahaz, in his unbelief, is given a sign and he refuses it. And so, let's just, let's just continue, actually, with verse 3, going into the next six verses or so. Then, seven verses. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz. So in this moment of, of struggle, of desperation, of what we know so far, which we haven't come to the Lord speaking through to Ahaz through Isaiah yet. I was getting my, ahead of myself a little there. But what we know is that the people know, Ahaz knows that Israel and Syria are coming against him. They want to remove him. They want to attack all this stuff, and he and the people are scared. Then, verse 3, the Lord said to Isaiah, go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Shir Jeshub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool, on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, take care and be calm, have no fear, and do not be faint-hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remaliah. Because Aram with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has planned evil against you saying, let us go up against Judah and terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach in its walls and set up the son of Tobiel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin. Now within <clears throat> another 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered so that it is no longer a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you will not believe, you surely shall not last. So Ahaz is in this spot, again, where he's, he's, he's afraid. He's seeing these guys coming against him. He's struggling. The people are struggling. He's afraid he's going to lose his throne and all of this stuff. And the Lord sends Isaiah to him and tells him, do not be afraid. Just, just that in and of itself. When you're afraid and then someone that you know is, is a man of God, they come to you and they say, hey, the Lord just wanted me to tell you, don't be afraid. Like that, that in and of, its, of itself should, should speak to us. Isaiah brings comfort in that the Lord has spoken saying, it shall not stand nor shall it come to pass. Isaiah is like, I see the powers that are coming against you. Well, the Lord through Isaiah is, I see what's coming against you, but don't worry. I am giving you my promise, Ahaz, that it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. And so he comforts Ahaz with that assurance, and he encourages Ahaz with what he should do, saying, just take care, be calm, have no fear, and do not be faint-hearted. And he adds at the end there, if you will not believe, you will surely, you surely shall not last. And so he's going, believe me, trust in me, don't be afraid. I'm not going to let this happen. I'm not going to let them overcome you. They, they, they will not stand. They're not those two nations. You're worried about yourself and your standing and, and, and Judah and your kingdom and all that. Those guys are going to be gone. These are the guys that are going to be gone. And so he says, calm yourself and listen to me. Be, do not be afraid. Be calm. Trust in me. And then he says, but if you do not believe, you too surely shall not last. And ultimately, Ahaz will not trust in the Lord. Ultimately, he ends up again choosing his, his, his own path, going his own way, making his own decisions, and, and rejecting the Lord. And we see it right here in verse 10. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz as if that, again, as if that wasn't, even, wasn't enough. 
that in his moment of fear of doubt and all this stuff, he sends Isaiah and says, do not be afraid. He comes to him again, and the Lord says, verse 11, ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as shoal or as high as heaven. So ask me anything. I want want to give you a sign, Ahaz. Ask me anything and I will prove to you. I will give you the sign that you ask to prove to you that I am the Lord your God and that I will keep my word and that you can trust me and that you do not need to be afraid. I mean, look at what we see, verse 12. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. It's almost like the Lord, after, again, he has just given Ahaz that word of encouragement and comfort, is like, I know what you're, I know what you're thinking, Ahaz, but before you make your decision, ask me for a sign. I, I, I can see that what I've already told you is not enough, though it should be. Ask me for a sign so I can show you that I mean what I say to you. Now, some of us might remember the, the religious leaders asking Jesus for a sign in Matthew chapter 12. We're told in Matthew twelve thirty eight and 39, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. The same way that Ahaz is, is basically speaking right now. They're coming to Jesus, Teacher, Rabbi, this, this you know, fake like respect and 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 humility teacher we want to see a sign from you and the, and the idea is we're calling you teacher we're acting this way but we're asking you we're demanding from you a sign to prove yourself if you want us to believe you truly in our hearts then show us a sign And then verse 39, but he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And that's typically how we think of of asking God for signs, right? We relate it immediately to this story or, or stories like this, and rightfully so. The Lord wants us to, to have faith in him, have not having seen, to not to demand a sign every time he calls us to trust in him. But there are those moments where the Lord calls his people to test him, or he just chooses to give his people a sign to bless them and, and show them that he is who he says he is and that he is worthy of our trust. Another Old Testament example is Malachi 3.10. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. The Lord was telling his people who, who he said were, were, were robbing him by, by not tithing according to what he had commanded, to give everything to the Lord and see that they would be blessed. This is one of those verses that we, where we get the saying, you, you can't outgive God. And he told his people to try him in this. Give the way that I have commanded you to give and see what I will do. See if I won't just open up the heavens and pour out greater blessing than you can even receive. And he tells them, try me in this. Just as he told Ahaz, Ask me for a sign, anything, ask me anything, and I will do it. And in both cases, the Lord was calling his people to obedience and and to trust in him. And in both cases, he knew the reality of their hearts. In Malachi, he goes on to speak of those who would continue to rob him and ultimately reject him in their pride, as well as those who would fear him and be saved. And and honestly, that was the choice that was given to Ahaz here. The Lord knew his heart. He he, he knew where Ahaz was at. And to get a better understanding of this ourselves, again, we can read 2 Kings chapter 16. There we get the, the, the history book version of what happened here compared to like the in-depth spiritual side of things that we get from 
Isaiah, where he's, this is what the Lord was saying. This is the, how the Lord spoke to Ahaz in that time. In 2 Kings 16, we just have the events as they unfolded. But what we see is that while the Lord was telling Ahaz to ask for a sign here in Isaiah, while the Lord was giving him this opportunity to, to trust him, Ahaz was weighing the Lord's offer of help and, and deliverance and protection against the help and deliverance and protection that the world was offering. And as we see in verse 12, instead of doing what the Lord told him to do in asking for a sign, Ahaz says, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. And again, on just first glance, we might be going like, hey, that, that sounds pretty spiritual. He's not just, he's not going to test God. He doesn't need a sign. It sounds like maybe he has the kind of faith that, that doesn't need the signs. But when in reality, as 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 7 tells us, he rejected the Lord and turned instead to Assyria for help, saying to the king of Assyria, again in 2 Kings 16, 7, I am your servant and your son. Come up and deliver me from the hand of the king of Aram and from the hand of the king of Israel who are rising up against me. That if, if we had read that this was what Ahaz said to the Lord, we would be talking about how, how Ahaz responded exactly the way he should have. I am your servant and your son, Lord. Come up and deliver me from the hand of the king of Aram and, and the hand of the king of Israel who are rising up against me. But that's not who he's saying this to. He's, he's saying this to the king of Assyria. It, it sounds exactly like a prayer to the Lord, but he's saying it to a man, to another king, to the powerhouse king by worldly standards, asking him for help while he has this offer from the Lord of deliverance, an offer that the Lord would give a sign to verify and, and reassure him of. And so the issue, just like those religious leaders who asked for a sign in Matthew 12, whether asking for or refusing a sign, the sign wasn't the issue. The issue was an unbelieving heart. In Matthew, again, going back to chapter 12, verses 30 and 39, which we just read, some of the scribes and Pharisees said to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So it's the sign that you're going to get is the sign that you already have. You already have the sign of Jonah, and you'll get nothing more than that. And then the Lord goes on in verse 40 saying, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. When they asked for a sign, his answer was basically, I, I am the sign. I am here. And you will see me just as Jonah was in the heart of the fish. You will see me in, in, or the belly, rather, you will see me in the heart of the earth. But I will rise as well. Jesus is the sign that came from heaven. He is the Messiah, the, the Christ. He is our God and, and Savior. And that really just struck, stuck out to me uh, from those verses in Matthew because look at the response given to Ahaz. So verse 10, of the Lord spoke to Ahaz again saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he, then this is Isaiah now, then he said, listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Isaiah is going enough with this false humility, the false spirituality, the lies, whatever picture you're trying to paint for everybody, A has enough of that. You don't, you don't treat people that way, but you would treat God that way? Or, or treating people that way wasn't enough for you? Now you want to treat God that way? It has pretended to be on the Lord's side, but this kind of hypocrisy before the Lord is an insult. It's, even, it's hateful to the Lord. And yet, look at the Lord's response 
to Ahaz's personal rejection. First he says, listen now, O house of David. And he, and he begins with that. Is it too slight a thing for you uh, to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? But notice there that he turns from Ahaz to the house of of David, and look at how the Lord continues in his response to Ahaz's personal rejection in the next verses. He immediately shifts again from Ahaz to the whole house of David and says in verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the, time he, at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. The Lord will bring on you, on your people, and on your father's house such days as have never come since the day that Ephraim separated from Judah, the king of Assyria." This is one of the most famous prophecies about our Lord Jesus Christ and his birth in all of Scripture. But we, all, we typically focus in only on verse 14. And what I've also found is that this prophecy, in its entirety, it gets a little bit confusing. Some commentators say that it really stops talking about Jesus after just verse 14 or maybe 14 and 15. Some believe that it is speaking only to the time of Ahaz in, in, in its entirety, and in verses 16 and 17 especially. Some even say that there was, uh, uh, and, and this is certainly possible, that there was an immediate fulfillment of verse 14, and that a woman in the royal family got married um, <clears throat> shortly after this prophecy and had a baby right away and unknowingly named him, uh, that baby Emmanuel, and there's the ultimate fulfillment in Christ. So there's a lot here that you might, you know, think is kind of up for debate. And, and to, to a certain extent, that's okay. The, the, the problem is that when we start getting deeper and deeper into these possibilities is that it gets easier and easier for us to just get so sucked in with prophecy for the sake of prophecy or, or knowing uh, prophecy that we become more and more confused and we lose sight of what the main thing is. And so for the sake of time, first of all, but also for the sake of keeping us focused on the main thing tonight, we're just going to focus on Jesus, whom verse 14 does clearly speak of at the very least. Matthew chapter 1 verse 22 confirms this for us, saying during Matthew's um, uh, account of Jesus' birth, now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Those verses, it's verse 14 right there. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, as you know right there from Matthew, means God with us. Now, some say that the word virgin is not the best translation for the Hebrew word. Ironside said of this verse, the virgin's son was to be God manifested in the flesh. It is only unbelief that would try to nullify the force of this passage by reading in place of virgin a young woman and attempting to make that young woman to be the wife of the prophet and the son born to be his son through her, which is another thing that people say that this prophecy is talking about Isaiah's son and that in a certain amount of time because it was only about 12 years from these countries being overtaken by, uh, by Assyria and all this stuff, and so some people try to fit that in here. Ironside just shuts that down. That's not the case. 
Another alternative belief of this verse. And then he goes on, it is perfectly true that the word rendered virgin might also be rendered maiden, but every maiden is presumably a virgin. If not, something is radically wrong. So that the prophecy here clearly and definitely declared that an unmarried virgin should become a mother and the child should be named God with us. That is not to say, as Rome does, that the Virgin Mary is herself the mother of God. She became the mother of humanity, of the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he who was thus born of her was God manifest in the flesh. And this has to be the case. I I, I did a study um, a few years back where I came across these this this poll, this study that was done, and I don't remember the um, exact numbers, so maybe I shouldn't even really mention it, but what it said was that Christians in America, among many other beliefs, have basically lost their belief in large part of the virgin birth. And then it was something only that about like half of people who claim to be Christians even believe that Jesus came and was born of a virgin. But if you don't believe that, you, you, you're not a, really a Christian, Because how could a man father God himself? He he couldn't. How could Jesus be, how could God himself be fathered by just two human created beings? He couldn't. It's impossible. The only way that he could come into this world, if he was going to come in through humanity the way that he did and be born of a woman, was if he was born of a virgin by the hand of God himself by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the Father, by himself. And so just like in Matthew 12 with the sign of Jonah, the sign that Isaiah declares here is Jesus himself. And we should need nothing more than that. And we can't disregard these signs because they might be difficult to believe. So often the Lord says to us, you know, go and and, and do this or that. And we're like, okay, Lord, but just... Give me a sign so I can be sure and I'll get right on that. And that's not, that shouldn't be our, our attitude. But on the flip side, we have what we see with Ahaz and what we see here where the Lord is like, go here and do this or that and here is a sign to show you that I'm in this with you. And we're like, whoa, Lord, I'm not trying to seek signs from you. I'm way too spiritual for that. I'll just, I'll just stay where I'm at doing what I want to do. But for us today, the sign, the sign that matters, the signs that matter, they've already been given. Because the sign for us is Jesus. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, for the unbeliever who says, I'm open to the possibility of, of believing in God, but I need something to convince me. The sign is Jesus. The Lord our God became flesh and dwelt among us and fulfilled the prophecies of old and went to the cross and became sin and died a sacrificial death so that all who believe in him might not perish but have everlasting life. That's the sign that he is who he says he is. A heart that is truly seeking the Lord will need no more than that. For the believer who says, I hear you speaking to me, Lord, but before I obey, I'm going to require a sign from you. I mean, I don't, I don't want to just be obedient and have it, you know, come back and bite me because of my blind obedience. Well, the, the sign has already been given. Again, in Christ. He has redeemed you, fulfilling the prophecies of old and being our God and Savior. What more do we need as those who profess to know him? Again, I've been going back to this verse a lot in our study, but Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's not just, you know, come to Jesus and then if he gives you a sign, obey him. No, it's come to Jesus and live for him 
Give your life for him. Obey him without hesitation. And along the way, maybe you'll be one of the lucky ones that he gives a sign to, that gets a sign or two along the way, where he says, I'm telling you to do this, and here is a sign from me, something miraculous, something supernatural. He does do that, but that's not what we need to be waiting for. That's not what we need to be looking for. And again, on the flip side, if he does, don't reject it. Though again, I'm, I'm getting off on a tangent here, but you know, just as, 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 as Paul writes in the New Testament, anything beyond what we have in Scripture, let it be anathema. Let it be accursed and re- reject it, anything that is outside of Scripture, even if it be from an angel of light, which the devil can appear as. But when the Lord has given a sign, and I'm talking about the signs of Scripture. We need to not reject it. And how do you know that you should do this, that you should live for him this way, that you should follow him this way? It's because of who he is and what he has done for you. You need a sign, Christian, before you live a life of radical obedience to him. Okay, again, as I've said multiple times, here it is. He came and was born of a virgin. And then just as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish, the son of man was three days in the heart of the earth, dying that your debt might be paid and rising again that we might know the life that we have in him. We should require nothing more than that. And of course, we are given much more than that. The Lord has, has given many more fulfilled prophecies. We, we all have experiences in our lives that, that demonstrate the trustworthiness of God. But that should be enough. E- even here we're given more, really, than verse 14 alone. Verse 15 says he will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. He's, he's going to be a man. He's going to eat the same way that we eat. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, verse 16 says again, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. These these lands, these kings were, were long gone when Jesus came. Verse 17, the Lord will bring on you, on your people and all your father's house, such days as have never come since the day that Ephraim separated from Judah, the king of Assyria. Which again was was fulfilled. Here in verse 17, that with the king of Assyria, the Lord does speak of the here and now for Ahaz. It is, it is in his turning to men and the world, he will, only, he will find only defeat. But the northern kingdom will find the worst days of their history when the king of Assyria comes against them. And so now... Uh, getting through the rest of the chapter as we spent all our time there on verse 14. We continue in verse 18. In that day, the Lord now continues on this theme of, of judgment. The, in that day, the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the remotest part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. They will all come and settle on the steep ravines, on the ledges of the cliffs, on all the thorn bushes and on all the watering places. In that day, the Lord will shave with a razor, hired from regions beyond the Euphrates, that is, with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs, and it will also remove the beard. Now in that day, a man may keep alive a heifer and a pair of sheep, and because of the abundance of the milk produced, he will eat curds, for everyone that is left within the land will eat curds and honey. And it will come about in that day that every place where there used to be a thousand vines valued at a thousand shekels of silver will become briars and thorns. People will come there with bows and arrows because all the land will be briars and thorns. As for all the hills which used to be cultivated with the hoe, you will not go there for fear of briars and thorns, but they will become a place for pasturing oxen and for sheep to trample. And so he goes on with the, with the judgment. He's, he's going to bring 
all of these people against the northern kingdom. Assyria, uh, from, from people from even going from Egypt. And they're going to be the, the, all the agriculture of Israel, which was one of the mainstays of the, of the nation at this point. It's all going to be wiped out. You'll have, a, you'll have a couple animals. You'll have to live off dairy, essentially. It's all you're going to have. Maybe some honey. And all that they had, their, their, all their agricultural centers and all that stuff would just be used for nothing more than just grazing of animals. Warren Wearsby writes, instead of trusting the Lord, Ahaz continued to trust Assyria for help. And Isaiah warned him that Assyria would become Judah's enemy. The Assyrians would invade Judah and so ravage the land that agriculture would cease and the people would have only dairy products to eat. The rich farmland would become wasteland and the people would be forced to hunt wild beasts in order to get food. It would be a time of great humiliation and suffering that could have been avoided had the leaders trusted in the Lord. And that's what happened. And again, Egypt would get involved as well. The, in, in Ironside's commentary on this chapter, he, he closes by talking about how the, this kind of seems like an odd place with all this going on, with, with everything that's happening and all that, that led to this prophecy. It kind of seems like an odd place for this prophecy of the Messiah to come. It's a time of war, a time of unbelief, not a time of, of seeking God. He goes on to explain that the kings of Judah were all part of the line of David, which the Messiah would come from. And so the kings of Judah were set by God to foreshadow his, his own blessed son. And we know that they didn't live that way, but that was how the Lord wanted to use them. Ahaz himself had forgotten and rejected the Lord and his law. And as this story played out, Ahaz would get through this attack by Israel and Syria, but he didn't have the courage to cry out to and lean on the Lord. He, he just wouldn't trust the Lord. It only got worse with Ahaz from making you know, this alliance with Assyria he, and, and, and saying those things, calling him the king of Assyria his father, essentially, calling himself his servant and his, and his son. He would also replicate the, the pagan altar that was, was used by the king of Assyria, and he would have that built in Jerusalem, and that's where he would start having the sacrifices made. He would cast aside the, the altar that God had designed that was built back for the tabernacle and all that. He, he, and that was at the temple. He, he just got rid, of all, got rid of that, kept it, but not for the daily sacrifices like it was meant to be used. And he brought in this pagan altar and started worshiping upon that altar. And so there was no help there should have been no help expected to come from the Lord. And it's on that note that Ironside says, how natural then that under the circumstances, God should speak of another king, a son of David, who was to be born into the world supernaturally and in his own time would show who the blessed and only potentate, king of kings and Lord of lords, who was the only king of kings and lord of lords. And so where it seems like kind of can be out of place, this is the perfect place. This is the perfect place for the Lord to say, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be Emmanuel, God with us, the king of kings. The world, skeptics, atheists, whatever, so many think that we have no reason to believe what we believe. Nothing could be further from the truth. There are so many out there who just say like, you guys believe in lies and there's no reason for you to believe that. And again, even maybe acknowledging, I would believe if I was given a sign. But they miss the greatest signs, the greatest sign ever given. And yet we can find ourselves taking that same attitude towards 
God sometimes. Either rejecting the signs that, that are given or just asking for more. Give me a sign if you want me to do that. Prove to me that you are worthy of my complete and total obedience and surrender. But we don't need any more than what has been given. And part of why we aren't to seek the signs is because, again, we already have the sign. We already have the signs. We have Jesus himself. And how do we know we can trust him? Because he is who he is. He is who he said he is. He came and he died and rose again for me and for you. And that should be enough for us. What more would we expect? What more can we expect of, of the God who, who saves? What more can we, and I mean that in the sense of what more can we demand in order to give our lives to him? That should be enough for us, especially considering all that he is and all that he has done in addition to that. And so for anyone listening tonight, for everyone here tonight, we need to put our trust in the Lord, no matter what we're going through, no matter how afraid we are of whatever we're going through. We need to trust God and trust that he has our best interest at heart, that, that he is our deliverer, and that he's going to fulfill his promises to us. Do that, and that is the life that will bring glory to his name. That is the life that is useful to him, that will impact eternity and this world. And, and that should be our goal, to live lives, to go wherever he tells us to go for his glory in obedience to him because he is God with us, Emmanuel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We know, I know, that there is so much left unsaid here. That there is a multitude of ways to apply this to our lives. But Lord, we ask that you would just take this time that we've shared together in your word and you would use it the way, that, the way that only you can. That you would use it for your glory. And that you would use it to make us more like your son. We love you. We praise you. We trust you, God. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.